quick tip. When you get X rank for the first time, go to the lobby screen while that mode is in rotation and click in the left and right stick at the same time. You're welcome in advance. Quick bit of housekeeping here. This actually won't be the last video in the series. In case you turned the April Fool's video off after the first 15 seconds, there's a teaser for a How to Get Top 500, which will be coming out after this one. I brought on Chara, Hamrum, Brock.com, and Shy, all of whom have played on impressive competitive teams and placed very highly in X rank in their careers, to VOD review some players at my level and try to identify patterns in their gameplay that they can work on to get them up to the Top 500 level. I learned a number of things from it myself that I'm already incorporating into my own gameplay, so I'm looking forward to digging through that footage and editing it together. But right now, we've got to talk about the big grind. Think about this for a second. S plus contains 10 different ranks. Between C minus, C, C plus, B minus, B, B plus, A minus, A, A plus, and S rank, Everything you've done so far up to this point has only gotten you halfway to X rank. The other half is all in S+. This is going to take a longer time than it has before. Well, I mean, like, not for me. I've already done it before, but, you know. With such a long way to go, I think it's important to keep tabs on how you're feeling and whether this is fun for you. Some players tell themselves they want to improve, they want to get competitive, they want to take the game seriously, they want to hit X rank, but their behavior betrays that that might not actually be the case. If you're trying to get better, and a strong player gives you advice, it would make sense to welcome that advice and change your habits accordingly. But some players get defensive. They feel attacked by that feedback. They defend their choices instead of reflecting, making the stronger player feel bad for trying to help them. Some players sit down and tell themselves, okay, I'm gonna get serious now, I'm gonna grind and really try to get better, and by game three, they're already playing random weapons because they got so upset at their results that they just gave up trying to take it seriously. If you don't really want X rank deep down, play the game the way that makes you happy, the way that energizes you instead. But now that I've thoroughly buried the lead, let's talk about your mindset while you play. Even players who really do have competitive goals and want to hit this milestone only have so much energy to devote to it. If you find yourself at a point in your ranked sessions where you're finding something to get frustrated about every game or you're getting down on yourself, stop playing. More practice isn't good if it's bad practice. I promise you, you're not playing your best in that state. You're not as likely to learn anything with that mindset, and you need to just disengage from the game and get your head back into it. Whenever someone tries to do something difficult that takes time and practice, all the ugly psychological defense mechanisms come out. We make excuses, we deflect blame, we protect our egos instead of admitting we messed up. This is getting in the way of your improvement, as it has gotten, and still gets, in the way of mine, and everyone else's to some extent, so take what I'm about to say as tough love. Your choice of weapon is not holding you back from X rank. If Kiver can get the silver arrow spray at top 500, then you can get whatever weapon it is that you want up to the 2000 X power that you need to maintain X rank. Your gear is not holding you back from X rank. I got the quad X rank using the starting gear without ever changing the patches or adding any slots. Your teammates are not holding you back from X rank. Sure, they're not playing perfectly. I'm sure a lot of them are making major misplays sometimes. But so are players on the other team. If you're really seeing the game so much better than players at that rank, you will win more than you lose, and you will get up out of that rank. The concept of ELO Hell, this supposed place in a matchmaking system where it's harder to advance because your teammates are so bad, doesn't make logical sense. It's just another way upset players have come up with to blame something other than themselves for their losses in team games. Now sure, you can't just carry every game, but you don't need to carry every game to make X rank. I sure didn't. The way I see it, if a top player like Kiver or Kyo or Zero could carry the game and I didn't, there's something I can be doing better. And instead of wasting my energy and messing up my focus, getting angry at something that's outside my control, I should improve myself as a player, and maybe even a person, by trying to learn what I can be doing better from my losses. The only common element in all of your losing teams is you.
This is also dating advice. Something that has helped me a lot with this is a training routine Hitzel put together into an app called Improve.Inc. You start by creating a list of a few major training goals, things like managing your tilt, paying attention to where your teammates are, not falling into walk and shoot syndrome, yes, even X rank players still have walk and shoot syndrome, ideas like that. After every game, you score how well you did on those goals from 1 to 5. Doing this reflection between games is really helpful for centering yourself. Maybe it was that focusing on what I could be doing better made me feel like I had more control over the outcomes and made me less likely to blame something outside my control. I'm not really sure, but something about it kept me calm and helped me learn and make better decisions. The app may or may not be available at the time the video is finished, since Hitzel created it for a school project that will be due at some point, and this video has taken ages to make, but that process will serve you well even if you just track it using a pen and paper or something like Google Sheets. I still maintain that your mindset is the most important part of improving, but this is a Splatoon video. I didn't work up a new file to Quad X rank just to talk about psychology the whole time. Let's talk about your aim. I said at one point that I'll probably talk about aim in every video in this series, since as a shooter, aim is the most important mechanic to train. Practice doing smart drills in the training room. Focus on being able to move your reticle from one target to the next in straight lines instead of weird curvy ones that take longer. And try to only fire when the reticle is actually over the place you want to fire at, so you don't alert an opponent before they're getting hit. Mix up where you start from, so you don't just learn to hit these particular targets from muscle memory. Practice tracking moving targets in addition to practicing snapping to the stationary ones. Okay, I've talked about it, moving on. Being better at aiming and moving around to make your opponents miss is not the most important skill in this video game. That sort of 1v1 test of skill is just a little mini game you play sometimes when you screw up to see if you can salvage something out of a bad situation. As many better Splatoon players than me have said before, good players win 1v1s, better players win 2v1s. Your goal should not be to win by mechanically outplaying your opponent. Your goal should be to rig the game so heavily in your favor with your choices leading up to that fight that you can beat a more mechanically skilled player. To do this, you need to understand when you have an advantage so you know to push it and get something from it, and to understand when you're at a disadvantage so you know to run away with your tail between your legs and stall for a better opportunity. In Splatoon, directing your focus at the objective, the way that you score, puts you at a disadvantage if someone decides to fight you. Paint going down on the zone is visible on the heads-up display, so opponents will know you're near it and know which direction you're facing so they can sneak up on you. The Rainmaker is slow moving and slow firing, and can't use subs or specials. Can't even receive ink armor when a teammate uses it. The tower puts you up on a small island that's easy to target, and as soon as you step on it all your opponents know you're there. Power clams reveal your location, and standing and throwing clams in the basket is a wide open invitation for your opponents to paint your face. If you try to play the objective without winning some advantages to offset the disadvantages you're incurring, your push will be short, your team will lose members quickly, and the counter push from your opponents will probably be stronger. The single biggest mistake S Plus players make by far is making the wrong choice given who has the advantage, either pushing when they don't have advantage, or playing too passively when they could be pushing their advantage and getting value out of it. So let's first talk about when you have advantage or not, and how to recognize that game state. And then we'll go over the decisions you should make based on that information. Getting splats doesn't mean everything, as any b rank player will tell you having seen someone get a solo Rainmaker KO while their entire team was dying someplace else. But it is arguably the single most important advantage you can have in this game, especially at a high level. On coordinated teams, if someone gets a clean pick, you'll immediately see someone use ink armor or some other combat special, and the whole team will rush forward as one to try and capitalize on the unfair fight they've earned for themselves. Someone on the other team is, at best, fighting a 1v2, and you're just not likely to win with those odds. As soon as a team has two more players up than the opposing team, they should immediately begin pushing the objective, since even if we decide the objective player is irrelevant to the fight, it's still a 3v2 or a 2v1 in the pushing team's favor. 
Strong x rank Splatoon players know, second by second, who is up and who is splatted on both teams. They even consider that, after being splatted, it will still take players at least a couple seconds to make it back to the front lines. So, for example, they'll still consider a fight to be in their advantage if the opposing team's players are respawning and they'll act accordingly. This level of awareness is crucial for high-level decision-making and also very difficult to attain. I'm still not great at this myself, but start working on it now. The more consistently you have this information, the smarter the plays you'll make. It doesn't matter that you have a numbers advantage if your opponents can isolate a player into a 2v1 before their teammates will come to their rescue. Ironically, people tend to be a lot better at keeping track of their opponents, players who are actively trying to avoid their detection, than their teammates who show up on their map and are highlighted on screen. Some skirmisher weapons really are built to be able to function on their own, but unless your weapon has a ton of built-in mobility like tetradulies and brushes, or a ton of survivability like the tentabrella, you should never take a position that's too far away from a teammate for them to back you up. Even if you are playing one of those solo skirmishers, you should only engage when it would take your opponent's attention off of something more important that your teammates are doing. So really, in some ways, these players need to be even more aware of their team's positioning than they would be if they were grouping up with them. Now, of course, be careful that you're not so close to teammates that a single bomb or special will take you all out. You also benefit from coming at your opponent from different angles, so you don't shot block your teammates and your opponent has to shift their aim away from one of you to hit the other. But your numbers advantage depends on your team fighting as a group, and the easiest way to make that happen by far is to go the same way your teammate did and initiate fights together. If you ever take 1v1s in your ranked play, reconsider how you might manage to avoid those engagements and be taking 2v1s instead. If there aren't any 2v1s to be had, consider just retreating from fights instead of starting them. You may not realize when your opponent that you think is alone might actually have help waiting to jump you from an off angle. Zoning, the concept of denying your opponent access to space on the map that we talked about in the A-Rank video, is so easy to see in Splatoon. If the map is their color, you probably don't have control over it, and if it's your color, you probably do. It's really pretty elegant. Hats off to the game developers for this. So just look at the map and think about how much range your opponent's weapon has. You take that range, draw it from where their ink meets yours, voila, that's the range you need to worry about getting shot at. Never super jump into that range unless you have a splashdown or a game-winning power clam you'll be able to make into the basket on landing. That edge right there is where you should feel the least confident you'll be able to move and run away from danger. If you're pushing into this color ink, you'd better be very certain that either no one is there, or that you have a big numbers advantage that's going to allow you to paint safely when you get there. No matter how simple this concept is when you're sitting watching a YouTube video, when you're playing the game, keeping track of numbers advantage, looking for threats, thinking about your movement, and all these other things, oh hi Twitch chat, it's easy to thoughtlessly ignore this neon colored warning sign of danger. When I panned my camera back in this clip from the A-Rank video, be honest, who noticed the purple ink by my basket before I pointed it out? Start thinking about paint not just as a combat advantage, but as vision. If you paint a common enemy flank route and then open your map, you can be like a wilderness tracker and spot not only whether an opponent has gone through there, but maybe even what type of weapon it is and how far it's gotten since then. Numbers advantage and pain advantage are perhaps more powerful, but one of the few things that can break a stalemate between two well-grouped teams fighting over, say, the zone in Splat Zones, is a well-timed, impactful special. Different specials do different things. Some, like Tenta Missiles or Booyah Bomb, disrupt the enemy team's positioning, letting you push while they're distracted or isolated. Some make it easier to get splats, like Ultra Stamp, Inkjet, or Stingray. Others paint and force the enemy team away from an area, like bomb rushes or ink storms. But whatever it is you're using, a special can be the X factor that tips the scales in your favor. X rank players keep track of specials at the same time that they're watching who's splatted and who's not. They also know audio and visual cues that can give you precious fractions of a second to get to safety. Hear three bombs getting thrown in quick succession? 
that's almost definitely an incoming bomb rush. See this flash across your screen? That cloud is pointing you to an enemy player that just received ink armor. Hear this sound? There's a baller nearby. If it came from above you, they're probably about to drop on you and explode. Hear this sound? That's a hammer. You should probably turn and look at the hammer. If you're about to try and push forward and realize the enemy has just popped an ink armor, try to stall until the armor wears off. If you're about to punish a jump and realize the player has splashdown, back up. If you're making your charger laser visible above a ledge and the area beneath you isn't painted, and that player might have an inkjet, well, you get the idea. This is an extremely temporary disadvantage state, but it's an important one that can make a big difference in your impact on fights. When you take an amount of damage that isn't enough to splat you, you do heal from it over time, whatever you're doing, but you heal much more quickly if you're in squid form in your own ink. If you just beat someone to the splat by one shot, and you then decide to take a fight with a full health opponent, it's not going to take a lot to splat you, and you'll probably lose. But if you wait just a second or two in your own ink, and then take the fight, you'll be back to full health. Don't forget to stop and heal when you can. While a lot of positioning in Splatoon boils down to whether you're grouping well with your teammates, there are some weapon-specific positions that give powerful advantages which you should be aware of in choosing your fights. If your weapon has range advantage over an opponent and you're able to initiate a fight outside their weapon's range, take as many 1v1s like that as you want because you should win every single one of them. Even if you're fighting the exact same weapon, you can actually create a slight but significant range advantage over them by having height advantage. So bear that in mind next time you're thinking of pushing someone uphill. Some weapons have projectile arcs that can allow them to hit around cover more easily. Although, strong players do learn to hit fall-off shots, even with weapons like shooters, and it keeps me up at night, man. Finally, any position can be advantageous if you got there stealthily and were able to engage from an angle your opponent wasn't watching. Stealth is a very temporary advantage, and won't just let you win 1v3s by flanking the enemy team like it used to in B-Rank. Also, while you're moving stealthily, you're not going to be painting very much, so you don't want to be trying to stay stealthy for long but it does make a difference when it's used in coordination with good predictions about where your opponents will be. My team not knowing there was a Hydra in this position led to a full team wipe as we all rushed the objective, and the game snowballed out of control from just this one play. On a competitive team, or even a pickup with competitive players, as soon as one player sees an opponent, everyone else on the team knows where they are about two seconds later, and if that player is isolated, they're getting pushed by at least two members a second after that. In solo queue, you have to see everything for yourself and guess at your teammates' intentions. Not knowing that a fight is happening is unfortunately common, but with good map awareness, you can make up for this more than you probably understand right now. Take this example from the VOD review I did with the Bravest Coaches. It's subtle, but you see how there's yellow paint right here on your ramp? If mm -hmm. he was here, that wouldn't be there. Or alternatively, if he was here, he would be like right about here, about to paint it. I think <laughs> I think it's it's that that little bit of yellow right there uh, that gives away to me. Okay, he hasn't gotten here yet because he had to have painted at least some of this to be able to push up onto this ramp. And so either he's still right here, and he's not there because he's there's not currently paint going down in this direction. Or I can probably just run straight to mid and, you know, beeline to my basket and get there before he does. There are tiny little clues like these all over the map if you have your camera positioned well enough to look for them. Anytime you're super jumping or returning to an inkjet launch point, use that second or so to gather information about the map from your bird's eye view. If you get a chance to sit on a wall, look over the top before you hop up. Sit and shark at the edge of your ink before you start a flank to see if anyone's noticed you yet and see if your teammates are in position to follow up once they see what you're doing. Learn to flick your map open and shut a couple times when you know you'll be safe for the next couple seconds to get an idea of where everyone's at right that second. The idea here isn't to get all the information right away. If you just sit watching the map, you'll probably fail to notice an opponent advancing and get splatted. You just want the vague sense of where the battle lines are 
where you can go that your teammates will help you, and who on the enemy team might be painting toward you. If you're doing it quickly enough, it'll take a couple repetitions on the X button before you actually get enough information to make any conclusions from, but that's good because that means you're keeping track of what's in front of you at the same time. Like I've said, the most common problem I see from S-plus players is a lack of awareness to the state of the game. But even if you know what's going on, that doesn't necessarily mean you know what you should be doing. Let's also go over the general game plan for what you should be doing with the advantage, what you should be doing when you're at disadvantage, and what to do when neither team really has much of an advantage just yet. At the beginning of every game, neither team has any advantages aside from maybe their weapon compositions, which you have no control over in ranked. Nobody has had a chance to paint the map, and nobody has gone down yet, barring any impromptu diving lessons. We're in what fighting game players would call the neutral game. This isn't to say that neutral doesn't happen after the beginning of the game, but you're all but guaranteed to have to play neutral at the beginning, and it can often determine whether the game is won or lost. Using what we've talked about regarding advantages and disadvantages, let's talk about what you should be doing in neutral. Do not get picked. Losing you for nothing is the single worst thing that can happen to your team at the beginning of the game. Now, if you took a 2v1 and went down, but your teammate was able to trade back by splatting the opponent, that might be fine, and good job taking a good fight even if the execution didn't go as planned. But you need to have gone in with a teammate, and a lot of the time solo queue players go down without having any idea where their teammates are early on. An even bigger mistake than getting caught out in the neutral game is trying to push the objective during the neutral game and getting picked from that. Remember, pushing the objective puts you at a disadvantage, so now, instead of an even 4v4, you're giving away your position, you're probably putting yourself way in front of your teammates who would otherwise be protecting you, and you're probably going to make it to about 85 points remaining before you get blown up and immediately lose the lead you tried to rack up from the next enemy push. One of the most important things that players tend not to do at this level and early X rank is patiently paint in safe places. Rushing at the objective instead of letting the opponent have it for a few seconds does several things. One, it doesn't give you a chance to look at the map, look right in front of you, and figure out what's going on. Two, it makes you less likely to have paint advantage when you fight. Three, it makes you less likely to have special when you fight. And four, it often means that the fight is starting before your whole team is there to help, and it can cause the feed stagger loop, which we'll talk about in the section on playing defense. Find a spot where you have cover and have an escape route in case you get rushed, and paint up for a second. Take the opportunity to do things like check the map for other players' positions, throw bombs where you don't want opponents to be, and figure out the best thing to do next. In all likelihood, the game won't stay neutral for long, so keep an eye on the heads-up display, as always, for shifts in the advantage state. Be very careful about your decision to commit to a fight. But if you see someone who's not paying attention to you, someone you've got range advantage on, someone who pushed into two or three of your teammates, you can not open the game up by taking that advantage, so don't just leave it unpunished. If your team does manage to get a clean pick, as a general rule, you want to take that advantage and snowball it. So get with a teammate or three and push up to keep the fight going while they're still at a disadvantage. You should still be somewhat careful at this point, since a single charger shot or dynamo swing can completely undo your team's advantage. So maybe pop a special like armor to give yourselves an edge. Keep using cover, make sure to heal before you go in, and give yourself an escape route anywhere you go. But if you're in a 4v3, you want to fight and get that to a 4v2 or a 3v1. As soon as you see an isolated player, bring your teammates and rush them. Once you have that golden two-player numbers advantage, you need to get someone on the objective as fast as possible. Points in Splatoon tick down faster than seconds. Hesitating for even two seconds loses you about four points on your push and gets your opponents a quarter of the way through their respawn timers. We've all lost games by far slimmer margins of error than that. That doesn't mean you should always be the one picking up the Rainmaker or riding the tower. If you do have multiple players in position to pick up the Rainmaker or ride the tower, the one who does it should either be a support weapon or a backliner. They need frontline weapons pushing up in front of moving objectives like that to clear a path for them. Now there are some weird exceptions to these rules I'm laying out because I'm really talking about four different game modes at the same time. In Splat Zones, the optimal play when you win a numbers advantage is to capture the zones before you even initiate a fight at all. 
The other team has lost painting power, so you'll cap it for free. And then once you've capped it and started scoring, you'll suddenly gain a whole bunch of paint in the middle of the map, some of which wasn't there before, which sets up a beautiful runway for a frontliner to go meow and chase down the other team. In Clan Blitz, if you win a fight and don't have enough clans yet, you may not have time to score before they respawn. You can speed things up a lot by finding the player with the most clams and throwing your clams at them, but if there are no other clams to follow up with, maybe just paint forward and play neutral from closer to your opponent's basket to stall for more time to grab clams and get a shorter run to the basket after the next fight. If you're able to win neutral without using your special, don't use it just to use it. Wait until the other team respawns, and then use it as they rush back in to defend, because they almost certainly won't have specials to use when they've just been splatted, and you'll be able to maintain your push using that special instead of wasting it on one retreating player. Lots of players at this level fall into the habit of popping their special as soon as it's available, instead of popping it as soon as it will be impactful. Know the difference and start working to fix this habit. Remember, painting in safe places is something s players need to do more, and when you've got a big advantage, their base has become a safe place for a short time. Paint up! It gives you vision, it gives you special, it makes it take longer for them to get back to mid, it gives you escape routes and the ability to move for combat. Painting is hugely important when you get to move into enemy territory. Once your opponents start to get back into the game, make sure you're in a powerful position to meet them. What that means depends a lot on the game mode and the weapon, but as a general rule, put ambush weapons under ledges they'll drop over, put backliners in high points further up on the map than usual to get picks on opponents who feel safe on their own side of the map, and put frontliners and midliners in position to meet opponents before they can contest the objective, and hold those angles for as long as possible. At some point though, unless this is like a 20 second Rainmaker knockout, your team will probably lose its advantage, and knowing when this happens quickly can mean the difference between being able to stall for 10 seconds before resuming your offense, and going four down and losing the lead. Even if you've got the clam basket open or a player is on tower, if you're in a 3v4, you have to realize that trying to play offense is a risky game. Sure, if you can get an extra power clam into an already open basket or win a checkpoint, that can be worth staying in there and getting splatted for. But a lot of the time, it would be more worth it to back up, stall for time, or just straight up run away behind some cover and this way for your splatted teammates to super jump back into you. To explain why, let's finally talk about defense. If your team is at a numbers disadvantage, you should not expect to be able to score or do anything more than stall an enemy push. I've talked a lot about how important it is to always, always, always know who has numbers advantage, but the biggest reason of all is so that you avoid the feed stagger loop. This vicious cycle is the worst thing that can happen to you in Splatoon. If you've ever played against the top team that really rolled you and made the game feel impossible, this is what they did to you. First, someone on your team got picked. Then the other team was able to pick another player or two by rushing with the numbers advantage, and eventually your whole team got wiped. Because the players didn't all go down at exactly the same time, some of them will respawn earlier than others, and these first players to go down are the ones who make the crucial mistake. These players enter a game state where their opponents still have numbers advantage. If they take a safe position near their spawn, maybe paint for special, and wait for their teammates, they can get rid of their opponent's numbers advantage, and maybe do a little something about the special advantage in the meantime. So they actually stand a chance of fighting once they can get into good defensive positions on the map. But a lot of players will see points ticking down and get desperate, and they'll run out to try and stop the objective while the game is still rigged against them. They get picked for taking a bad fight, and now the rest of their team is stuck at a numbers disadvantage for another 10 seconds, even though the rest of them have now respawned. Meanwhile, the objective is still ticking down further and further, making each player with their spawns staggered from their teammates more likely to feed in out of desperation. This will result in a KO unless one of the players wins a low percentage fight and stops the objective push, or the players stop staggering and take a good fight for once. Don't be the cause of a stagger. Be okay with letting the opponents score, giving up a checkpoint while you still have time, losing lead while you still have time, if it means that the retake is a sure thing for your team. 
What you can still do is stall. Throw bombs in front of the Rainmaker while you know you're safe from their teammates. If the Rainmaker is forced to stop because of a bomb in front of them, you've earned your teammates a couple more seconds to get back into the game, and you can often accomplish this safely even in a 1v4. If you can hop on the tower and still have time to jump off and get away safely, you can start the process of sending the tower back to mid, which buys you just a little bit of time. When you do have enough advantages to push back in, use specials to signal to your teammates that it's time. And if you see multiple teammates in position that are going in, go in with them. It's an error to go in too early before you have advantage, but it's also an error not to use your advantage when you have it, so don't get too passive. Always be gathering information and know the game state, so as soon as things shift in your favor, you can start making up for lost points. The different game modes all have different tactics for offense, defense, and neutral game, and this video is already pretty long as it is. Fortunately, a better analyst than me has already made videos covering each one and how to think about them. See links in the description for FLC's videos on the fundamentals of the four different game modes. They're a little bit less structured and maybe a little bit less kid-friendly at times, but at the end of the day, these videos are basically the textbook on what players' objectives should be at any point in a game in these modes. Every prospective competitive player should watch them and try to learn to analyze the game from scratch the way FLC demonstrates. If you're shooting for X rank, you're essentially becoming a competitive Splatoon player, whether you meant to or not. At this level, learning the game becomes much easier if you connect to the competitive community and start using its resources. I personally have always preferred playing in a team environment instead of solo, so if that's something you want to try, check out this video I made on how to find your team. Go to this Discord server to find a huge menu of different resources on Discord, including Sendu.inc, the place where top players post their gear builds for all the different weapons, and a whole bunch of different servers where people post about upcoming tournaments as well as to play pickup scrims with other competitive players for practice. If you still have some nagging questions and want some more individual attention, I do a show called Squid School every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Arizona time, where I spend the first hour watching viewer-submitted footage and coaching them. Contact me on the Bravest Community Discord, link in the description, to get this set up. X-Rank is a pretty elite group of players, but before we go, let's get one thing clear. You can make it to X-Rank. It will take different people different amounts of time. Oh, I splattered him! I splattered Shaq! I'm the best in the world! And you'll have to practice consistently and thoughtfully without letting yourself get frustrated. You'll have to be willing to seek out criticism and be willing to change. But I believe that everyone can do that, and that it really is just a matter of time. So for those of you that I'll see in my future X-Rank lobbies, I'll just say in advance, good luck, have fun.